Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first panel of the morning entitled uh, Capturing the Research Lifecycle. My name is Courtney Soderberg, and I'm the Statistical and Methodological Consultant at the Center for Open Science. We're a nonprofit startup in Charlottesville, Virginia. And this morning, we have a great panel of people who are working on increasing the openness, reproducibility, and accessibility of many different points across the entire research life cycle. So over the past couple of years, there's been a growing movement to increase the openness and transparency of science, as well as the reproducibility of science. And so what we, what we have for you today is leading organizations and companies who are working towards that movement. We're going to talk a little bit about how we are trying to accomplish those goals, and also some of the challenges we've encountered while working towards those goals. Um, so together, our panelists represent work that is going on at many different points in the research life cycle. Um, so we have Tim Gardner from Riffin, a company that is working on automatizing data acquisition and analysis to increase reproducibility. Arfran Smith from GitHub, a company working on sharing and collaborative coding. Ryan Dooley from Texas Advanced Computing, Texas Advanced Computing Center, there we go, um, a leading university high performance computing center that's working on sharing code and scientific data. We also have Lars Nielsen from Zenodo, a project out of CERN working on the sharing and citability of data and code. We have John Lees Miller from Overleaf, a company working on creating collaborative tools for publishing and writing. We have Robert Spiegel from Publicize, an organization working on increasing the dissemination of scientific research. And we have me, um, not a less awkward way to say that, uh, from the Center for Open Science, a nonprofit working on increasing the connectivity, documentation, and openness across the entire scientific workflow um, using our infrastructure project, the Open Science Framework. So how this is going to work is we'll start out with everybody giving two to three minute lightning talk so you get a better understanding of who we all are and what we do. Um, but the majority of the panel will be um, for panel discussion and Q&A from the audience. Um, so I'll go ahead and start us off. As I mentioned, I'm from the Center for Open Science. We're a nonprofit organization who is dedicated to increasing the openness, reproducibility, and transparency of the, of the entire scientific workflow. And we do this through three major efforts. <laughs> no worries. Um, <laughs> so the first is our meta science project. So we do science. Where's the clicker? Ah. So, right. So the first is meta science project. So we do science on science. And we do this to be able to track the extent of reproducibility issues and also look at how changes in scientific behavior leads to changes in the quality of scientific output. We also have community efforts, so working on training scientists in better open and reproducible practice, as well as getting journals to adopt open standards and practices. And finally, we have our infrastructure project, the Open Science Framework, which is really about uh, it's a free open source platform that is trying to make it easy for scientists to implement these open and reproducible practices. So as I mentioned, the Open Science Framework is a free open source web tool, and it's really trying to connect, document, and archive, and also make openly accessible the entire research workflow. So everything from the beginning implementation of a project idea, all the way through publication and post-publication discussion, to making that research and data searchable and discoverable by other researchers. So the OSF does this by allowing researchers and their collaborators to upload all the files related to a research project. So they can upload all the input and output of a research, sorry, research project in one central location. There's also automatic logging and versioning so that the evolution of a project is documented. And then with one click of a button up here, they can either make the entire project or parts of that project publicly accessible and searchable so that other researchers can find their um, research output and input and also use it and cite it. So the research kind of propagates to other research projects. And so by making this very easy for scientists to do and putting it in all one location, what we hope to do is make open and reproducible practices more normative throughout science. 
We also connect the OSF to a grow growing list of add-ons, which currently includes uh, Dataverse, Figshare, Dropbox, GitHub, and Amazon S3. And the reason we do this is to allow researchers to continue to work with the tools that they like and they're familiar with. So rather than, rather than requiring researchers to make this huge overhaul to their workflow in one fell swoop, we allow them to kind of make slow changes to the workflow. So they can still use these tools, but they're all connected in one central hub. And the reason why this is useful is it, A, makes things less likely to get lost. So if you have some of your project in your email and some on a server and some on your collaborator's laptop, these pieces and parts can get easily disconnected and things can go missing. But it also makes it easier to share that entire project with your collaborators and with other scientists. And so it's really about meeting researchers where they are. So allowing these kind of incremental changes to the workflow, which will lower the barriers to implementation by scientists because they don't have to make this huge overhaul. And so the aim is to make it easy for researchers to make these choices and these workflow changes to allow open, transparent, and reproducible scientific workflows for everyone. All right, so next up, uh, are these all on one slide deck or do we no, switch? No, okay. Cool, okay, thanks everybody. Um, so my name's Arvon Smith, I work at a company called GitHub, and we've got a cool thing in the corner. Ah, there we go. All right, so um, apologies for the stupid title, I was trying to think of something funny. Um, so I work at GitHub, um, before GitHub I um, uh, co-founded a, a crowdsourcing platform called Zooniverse, we did lots of citizen science. Uh, I'm interested in tools that help people do research better together, basically. So very briefly, uh, that didn't work. Go to the next slide. Clicker, this one. Okay, so what's GitHub? Well, GitHub is a place where people do software development together. Why can't I scroll this? Oops. How do I just go page to page? Sorry. Let's try again. No, okay. No. All right, let's just see how we get on. Okay, so GitHub is a platform where people build software together. There's about 10 million people working up there, uh, and there's about 15 million software repositories. So these are places where um, people actually uh, collaborate around software development together. Um, the, the way that I usually explain research uh, to researchers uh, version control is this. Uh, most of you probably have a folder on your computer or many folders on your computer that look exactly like this, maybe with some other versioning technology that you're using. Um, my PhD supervisor, by the way, used underscores. Uh, instead of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, naming conventions like this, because if you put a number, an, an underscore at the start of a file name in most operating systems, it jumps to the top of the tree. So you can put multiple underscores if you really want to make it the latest one, and that is what he did. This is obviously a terrible idea, so there are better ways to do this, which uh, things like Git, so this is a versioning technology. Here we've got about 50 people writing a mathematical textbook, um, uh, and as you can see, there's, sorry for the transition, <laughs> this is the way it's going to work. Um, you can see uh, uh, time-based changes, and each of those changes, if you look at those, are, you know, there's an explicit red-green, red for lines taken away, green for lines added. This is a technology, Git, the technology that powers this, is a technology that was developed originally for um, managing the 20 or so million lines in the Linux uh, kernel. So the the thing that I spend most of my time thinking about in uh, GitHub is increasing the status of software in academia. There's a, uh, in my mind, and I think in lots of people's mind, a fundamental problem uh, in the way that we do research and we credit uh, uh, research activities that right now you don't have a particularly good career if you spend a lot of time writing software in academia. And so one of the, one of the things we can do to help with that is do things like this. This is an uh, integration that we put together uh, via our mutual APIs with Zenodo. Lars is going to talk in a second, I think, about this, maybe a bit more about sort of hacking the existing system. So getting a DOI for a GitHub repo. Does that make it citable? Well, it was already citable with its URL, but it gives it something that smells a little bit more like an academic citation. And, and so this is actually something that's being used about 1,500 times now um, in the last six or so months. And 1,500 times, that's 1,500 research software packages that have been archived in Zenodo, not just, uh, uh, you know, that's a relatively small fraction of the tens of millions of repos up on GitHub, but these are research ones. The thing that I'm most excited about when thinking about uh, GitHub and the, the, the sort of opportunities of uh, the platform within academia is that there's actually 
uh, a way that open source communities, people build software together that's very different from the way that academics usually work. And in short, uh, open source communities are better at collaborating than most of us because they have to be, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to build something together. And so when we talk about open source, uh, 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 lots of people think this is a kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, open or die rant about um, doing, all of our, doing all of our software development or all of our research open and in the public. And it doesn't actually have to mean that. The principles of open source ways of working are actually things that we would all recognize as a thing of value. And those are pretty simple. They're things like electronic communications with all your communications being available. This doesn't mean email. Email is not available unless you're going to give everyone access to your inbox. So it's about everything having a URL the process by which decisions were made being exposed. And this is, again, this is actually an internal conversation thread. This is a screen grab of uh, uh, one of our internal repositories at GitHub, where we're making, we're having a conversation about a change in the product. But I can go back and look at that three years later and see how that process came about. And this is a technology thing, but again, some technologies allow lots of processes to happen in parallel, and then uh, conversations, approval, uh, and increments, improve, improvements in what you're working on, the decision can be deferred till later. So this is actually the CMS software that uh, runs the uh, detector on the Large Hadron Collider. This is lots and lots of different development branches all being worked on in parallel uh, uh, together uh, at the same time and decisions being made uh, um, when, when sign-off is ready. So open source collaborations are lower friction than academic ones usually. And actually, Fernando Perez, who writes the IPython notebook, had a great phrase in a blog post of his where he described open source as being reproducible by necessity. And I think this is something there are communities who work uh, in reproducible ways uh, because they have to. And so I think I just wanted to say, because we're about to have a panel, and uh, you meant to set yourself up by saying something stupid you're going to regret later. I don't think reproducibility is a technology problem or a new technology problem. I think reproducibility is actually a workflow and cultural one. And so I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Ryan Dooley. I'm from Texas Advanced Computing Center. It is a, um, um, if you've never heard of TAC, TAC focuses on um, uh, operating a lot of the, the large um, supercomputers for the academic science community. I'm located in Austin. We're hiring. If you want to live in Austin and do cool stuff and play with great technology, come talk to me afterwards. Um, but I am here talking about um, Agave, right? And Agave is a science and service platform. And, and what do we mean by that? Well. Um, it means that we, it allows you to run your scientific codes uh, on HPC or um, those high-performance computers, these big, big Beowulf clusters, um, high-throughput computing, um, lots of little computers spread out all over the place that just need to churn through a bunch of work, um, or cloud resources. Uh, manage your data from the web and, and remember how you did it. Right? It's, a, it's really just an API platform. Um, it's very RESTful. It's multi-tenant, um, hosted identity management. So we can um, provide you with uh, you know, your, your LDAP if you need it, or we can plug into your local um, identity solution. We support uh, multiple IDPs. Like I said, we have a, you know, a standards-based authentication mechanism. Um, we provide API management. Um, it can run on-site or off-site. There's a lot of flexibility. The point is that it's a platform um, that allows you to build your digital lab. Right? So whereas I, I think the, uh, the keynote was talking quite a bit about the, the need for infrastructure and the need to um, uh, have kind of these fundamental building blocks that, that other people can just kind of take for granted, like the utility grid. Um, that's really what, what Agave does, right? So it was funded by the National Science Foundation for about 10 years. Um, now it's adopted in several countries, joint funded um, internationally. We have data replication all over the world. Um, and it's free, free to use. Um, just come and use it. You can fork it on um, GitHub or, or um, Bitbucket and uh, take it to do whatever you want want to do. Um, but it's easiest if you just think of it like a Salesforce for science. So um, it kind of meets you at your needs. So if you're a developer, great. You have APIs to use. If you're a service provider, um, great. There's stuff for you to integrate with. Uh, if you're an infrastructure provider, um, there's ways for you to, to delegate and kind of modernize your infrastructure. If you're an educator, it gives you um, rooms to, 
gives you a facility to, to really spur discussion without having to understand the underlying technology. And if you're a researcher, it just allows you to do your science faster. Right, so it's used um, in a lot of different places. These are um, sort of larger funded projects that are building web applications on it on the left-hand side. Um, we also build mobile apps on it at TAC. Um, our, we eat our own dog food, so our mobile app is built on top of it. And it's also used to extend existing processes. So, um, you know, for all the coders in the room, here's the terminal. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the interesting things, and I think kind of the reason I'm, I'm here today is that um, we've been working a lot with um, Docker repo recently to, to really spur reproducible science. And whereas Agave really focuses on infrastructure and, and providing you the mechanism for, for conducting your science and capturing those experiments in a reproducible way, the code themselves tends to be a, a big tripping point. If you want to run in different environments, it becomes very difficult. Just having a social coding platform um, is, is helpful for the development, but you still have to set up your environment. And, I mean, all the DevOps processes involved with it are huge roadblocks to people. So. We've been working to build up this application repository um, where people can um, uh, integrate uh, uh, containerization of you know, dockerization of their, their application codes so that they can share those and run those in a very reproducible way using Agave as kind of an execution mechanism. And what that's allowed them to do is, um, as a researcher, you can develop your code locally. Um, you can develop it in collaboration over a, a, a distributed source control management. Um, solution, and then you can run it locally. You can run it on your local university systems, in the cloud, in your local data center, in a private data center, um, on all of these commercial providers with a single interface in a single way so that when you have to go back and you have to reference your, your discovery, you can reference not only the, the, um, the, the code that you used in, in terms of a source code, but you can actually reference a reproducible um, uh, a Docker image that someone can pull down and it's, um, it's an answer box, right? So it's this black box where if you give it the same data, it'll give you the same answer, and you can validate that the results they got were accurate. Um, and that's been hugely helpful for us. But I'm going to run out of time here, so I just want to say if you need more information, here's some links, and um, these slides should be available on the, the website. Okay, so yeah, my name is uh, Lars von Nielsen. I work for CERN, and uh, it's often assumed what CERN is, but for those who don't know, it's uh, the European Nuclear Research uh, Center in uh, Geneva and Switzerland. We have a very large uh, research infrastructure that has been uh, running for nearly 60 years now. Um, and basically, um, if we go here, that's quite a lot of ways to, to lose your research data. Here's just uh, one example of a, of a lost laptop with crucial scientific data and many years of uh, research work inside. Uh, I have more examples uh, for those who, who want to see it. Um, so basically what we're trying to do with Sonodo is make it as easy as possible to get your research data into a proper digital archive uh, and avoid a fate like this. Um, that's the, the core part of it. And uh, one way that we are trying to do that is uh, collaborating with GitHub and making it as easy as possible to snapshot your software in GitHub and give it a DUI um, and make sure that it is available in the future. So um, it works pretty simple. You sign in with your, uh, with your GitHub account, you flip a switch on your source code repository, and then you go to GitHub, start making releases, and every single time you make a release, we automatically drag down a, a snapshot. You don't even have to worry anymore about, uh, about uh, getting it. And you can even, uh, using our DUI batches, you can then uh, advertise um, that you actually have a DUI and that you should cite this piece of software if you're using it. Um, and not only um, can we then grab the software and get it into Sonodo, we also uh, export the software again. So one example is that we have a community for high energy physics where we then grab software from GitHub. We export it again to the high energy physics repository called Inspire. And they are capable of actually linking the software together with the, with the paper that is citing this piece of software itself. So just one example of how this workflow can be made uh, super easy for, uh, for researchers so they don't really have to think too much about what's, what's happening in the background. And that's basically it. So I'm John Lees Miller. I'm one of the co-founders at Overleaf. 
So at Overleaf, we're basically building Google Docs, or maybe I should say Office Online, um, for scientific papers. So it's online collaborative editing, but with a focus on features that scientists need. Um, so we're now up to about 150,000 users all over the world, and they've written over 1.5 million documents now on Overleaf. But Overleaf actually started um, as a much smaller project. It was basically something that I wrote when I was a PhD student, just to make it easier for me and my colleagues to write papers together. So <laughs> we, were, we were using this tool called Etherpad, which was like a really basic sort of precursor to Google Docs. It was basically just an editable text file in the cloud. You could all go in and you could write um, at least a draft of your paper. But it didn't really, it solved the collaboration problem really well, but it didn't do things like um, figures or references or equations. And you couldn't really see the results of, of what you were writing, um, you know, how it would look in the end. So, so basically, I, I sort of incrementally wrote extensions to Etherpad that would kind of help solve these problems. And it's slightly embarrassing to show you what the first version of Overleaf looked like in about 2012. It was very basic. Um, that's what it looked like. So it was basically an Etherpad on the left there where you could write your source code. So we were all mathematicians. So we would write in LaTeX because that's what we like to use. Um, you could upload figures in the files menu there. And there was also a real-time preview of the final typeset output. So you could finally see what it was going to look like when it was done. Um, so it was very basic, but it was a sort of minimum viable product. As they say, it got it out there. It was on the internet. People started using it. They invited their collaborators. And that's what really kind of kicked off the growth that we've seen. So fast forwarding to today, um, the product has come on a lot. But you can still, still see it's got the same sort of idea. Um, you write in this sort of rich text um, manuscript view. So you don't have to know LaTeX anymore to use it. It's, um, it's all sort of hidden away from you. So you know if you write a blog in WordPress, you can either edit the HTML directly or you can switch on rich text mode and not have to worry about the HTML. We do basically the same thing uh, with LaTeX underneath. And you can switch it off if you want to. You can keep the source underneath. Um, other things that we've been working on are around really making it easy for people to manage different versions. So Arfan had a great slide. That was pretty much how we used to manage things, except instead of .docx, it was .tech. But you know, final, final, v1, final. Um, so now you can take your right LaTeX project. You can compare any two versions. There's an integrated commenting system. So you can have a discussion in line in your document and sort of manage those changes and see who's changed what. Um, and then when you're finished with your paper, you can then publish it to one of our publishing partners. We've now got about a dozen people on board. So for example, if you're going to submit to Life Sciences Publisher F1000 Research, you can just click a button, and we send all the files and all the metadata and all that stuff over in the background so you don't have to worry about it. And we're sort of building these integrations up now so that with F1000 Research in particular, um, when you submit that sort of back and forth between their editorial staff and you, the author happens now on Overleaf. So you don't have to um, send a bunch of files around by email. So that makes everything just a little bit faster, a little bit nicer. And that's really an important part of the direction that we see for Overleaf, which is the new name for Write LaTeX, which is our original name. Um, it's all about, one, um, collaborative editing. It's about the rich text modes. So you don't have to know LaTeX to use it. And it's about bringing more of the scientific process um, off of people's laptops and out into the cloud. Because I think that if you make that process easy, you then have a lot of options for how you make it easy for people to, to then make things open and make things much more transparent. And that's a really powerful idea. So thanks for Overleaf. And Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rob Siegel. I'm the founder of Publicize. And essentially what Publicize is, is it's a science communication platform to essentially provide and help researchers formulate their research into terms that anyone can understand so that we can start disseminating research to different audiences. So I like to think of research dissemination being broken down to three different audiences. First, there's the intradisciplinary audience. And this is kind of scientist to scientist of the same field communication. This is journal articles, and um, for obvious reasons, this is kind of what everyone, this is basically how everyone, uh, this is essentially the most attention is paid towards this audience. 
And we can kind of see that here today. Everyone's kind of talking about how can we help researchers out better communicate with other researchers. But there are two other audiences that receive very little attention, and that's the interdisciplinary audience and the public. And as a result, because these are audiences that don't have the terminology, they haven't gained experience for so many years in all the terminology, you have to reduce the complexity and reduce the jargon. And this is a very difficult task, and this is something that's often overlooked. So in, this, um, in these two audiences, the interdisciplinary and the public, this is where really great things can happen. This is often where implementation actually occurs, when a researcher puts out there all the information to someone uh, in the private sector who's not active in research. They can actually take this knowledge and implement it. There's lots of, obviously, cross-field collaboration. This is where people, say, from biology can interact with someone from atmospheric science to look at some different uh, research project. And this often doesn't happen when, you know, for example, I'm an atmospheric scientist. I don't go and read biology journal articles. So how is it that I can actually discover the latest research in a different field? And then there's also, uh, obviously, innovation. This is when different minds of different backgrounds can actually bring new things to the table so that we can innovate faster. And then policy also is extremely important, and that is a very, very difficult challenge. How do we get this information from us to people of the different audience so that we can implement and make change? And there are other examples as well. So this is kind of where Publicize sits. Publicize, essentially, the main goal is to disseminate research in terms that everyone can understand so that we can take all of this great knowledge that we have and actually bring it to different audiences. So I've created a, um, a few months ago, I've created a kind of a minimum viable product. And this is essentially a website where scientists can go up and they can uh, essentially rewrite their research article in about three to 400 words. And there's guidance to help the scientists formulate for a different audience. So they go up there, and there's kind of a back and forth process. So we essentially act as the editor so that we can make sure that the information is not only understandable by the layperson, but also scientifically accurate so that we don't have miscommunication. So we essentially have this back and forth process where Publicize helps. And then what you get are the, is this website with articles written by the scientists that can be disseminated on th throughout social networks and anywhere else throughout the internet. And I'll leave it with that. A quick overview of all our panelists. So I guess we'll go ahead and open it up for discussion questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, how do you prevent lockdown into your platforms? Like we talked before about profitability as one solution. I would like to hear, you know, how do you prevent somebody to work in your platform and then, you know, cannot take this away? Or something? Go, oh, I can go first if you like. Um, so with, with Overleaf, everything is still stored in LaTeX, and LaTeX is an open source technology. It's been around for a long time, so you can always download everything. It's one click, and then compile it locally or wherever else you want to do it. So we definitely don't lock people in. With Riffin, uh, first of all, all of the design files will be um, exportable to an open standard called ANIML, a -N -I -M -L, which is an ASTM-supported standard. So it's a container. You can push it out, it's text-based, so if you don't have software, you can still read it, or you can write your own software for it. We'll also, um, we're planning to make the entire um, driver technology for data acquisition open source as well. Um, our, <coughs> our platform is, is totally open source, right? So you can get clone it, and then you can, <coughs> you can just do a Docker build, it'll deploy the entire thing. All your data is exportable, and, and the systems and science that it enables run on systems that we don't own. So. Um, you know, you own your stuff, you, you have access to it. Uh, so Git is a distributed technology by sort of definition. So GitHub's role is a collaboration point around something where anybody could host that collaboration point. I guess um, there's probably metadata associated with the repositories that is um, not in the Git data, but that can be exported. There's a rich API that people use. So. Sure. <laughs> okay. Big questions. Sure. 
<laughs> so the question was um, if uh, if I got it right, uh, how you can um, how you can win the login, prevent login. Yeah, yeah, prevent login. So at uh, Sonodo, the entire platform is open source, is GPL licensed. Um, on top of that, um, all the metadata is CC0 licensed, you can take it away. Um, the actual data files has a license attached to it. If you own that data, there's nothing preventing you from taking it out and putting it somewhere else. And with Publicize, um, I mean, the whole point is to get the information out to everyone, so it's inherently kind of open source. Um, but um, essentially, the way that it works is the scientists own the content, so they're free to do whatever they want, and it's uh, open source, and they're simply licensing, um, lic licensing it out to me so that I can publish it on Publicize, but it's completely owned by the scientists. Yeah, and at the OSF, it's also completely open source. Um, anything that you put up there, you can take down at any time. You can download um, files that you put up there. And we also have a sustainability fund in place. So if something were to happen to us, the whole system would be frozen at that point in time, and you would always be able to get to anything you put up and download it at any point in the future. Great. Next question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah and then I'll repeat the question. Oh, okay. I'll just repeat the question. Don't worry. Oh. Uh, so each of these products are all a certain step in the kind of life cycle of research from, get, from like, uh, getting the files off your machine to the point where you're disseminating it to a wider audience through publicized. So, but this is already six different things. And um, I, I just wondered if people could comment on the idea that one solution fits all uh, my own personal thing thinking is it shouldn't, but you know, Elsevier do a lot of that. What that you have to, they can do everything, but it's a, it's a lot of stuff. But otherwise, we're expecting everybody to sign up for at least six accounts for things, and then, and and kind of, where is the balance between those things? Because yeah, some people think one size fits all. Some people think six different products is great. How do we link them all together? Should I start? Okay. So uh, in terms of Sonodo. Um, so one is, I think we need infrastructure like Orchid, so we support the login with Orchid. I think that's, uh, you know, if most of the, the tools here should just support that, then we have one account that we can all use. Um, and I really don't believe in one tool for, for doing everything. Um, I think you have to do one thing really well and then do the integration, as you say, between the two, like, for instance, the, the GitHub integration that we both have. But on that point, GitHub are never going to have login with Orchid, right? Uh, I wouldn't know, to be honest. I mean, the problem I have in my role at GitHub is that the majority of users of GitHub are not academic users. Yeah. So the idea of an ORCID ID is sort of confusing. Uh, yeah, you can't log in with your Facebook account or your Twitter account to GitHub. So I would argue they would probably come first before ORCID. That said, if we solve for one, then you know, it's a standard. Um, as, as to, um, so your question kind of gets to what I was thinking about. I um, I would just uh, reinforce what Lars was saying. I think we like. I think products are best when they focus on solving one thing well, and GitHub's role, uh, and it's been kind of repurposed. And academics are very good at hacking systems. I think to do what they want. Um, GitHub's trying to build the best possible tool for building software with other people. Um, just turns out that lots of academic formats um, are versioned well in Git and by GitHub. Um, and so I don't know. I I, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, potentially a problem having all these products, but I would rather see people solve problems really well and then expose their data and allow people to build around their product. I think that's uh, the way the web works, actually. Yeah. So <clears throat> Agave is kind of a, a low-level piece. Um, you can think of it like a, a platform. So it provides a federated uh, authentication and authorization framework, so you can plug directly into whatever you're already using. So it, it actually means you have one less account that you need to use. But in terms of you know <coughs> integrating with other applications and building the entire stack on top of that, you know in, whether it be a, a, a center for open science building, you know uh, execution into their their framework, then um, you, most of the time people don't know we're underneath, right? We power hundreds of applications and no one knows. Yeah, sure. So I 
I'd echo the, the sentiment that probably we're not gonna find a single tool that does everything that every scientist wants to do just because scientists do so many different things. Um, certainly at Overleaf, we've, we've had quite a lot of success sort of doing API integrations. So I think open APIs, well-documented APIs are very good things. So we integrate with Figshare. Um, you can link your Right Latex um, Overleaf account to Figshare. And we also now integrate with Mendeley, so you can link your Mendeley account and your Overleaf account. So, you know, I think that having this sort of system where, where things are separate but can all interoperate is a much um, more powerful idea than, than just trying to build one monolithic tool. Yeah, and I kind of uh, agree with that model as well. Um, Publicize is dramatically different than GitHub, for example. You know, so that's going to be pretty difficult to be able to do both of them really well. Um, but um, but yeah, so Publicize is still in its very early stage, so we don't have any fan, you know kind of fancy um, sign-in methods. Um, but um, but that is definitely in the, in the future. Uh, I agree with everything everyone said, and I think people are just fundamentally too creative to try to constrain them to a, a single company or person or organization's view of how everything should be done. So you need to give them the ability to, to uh, gain advantage from the tool you provide, but the flexibility and uh, uh, creative freedom to take it whichever direction they want. Yeah. And I also think there is something to be said for allowing users to still use the tools that they're used to and they're comfortable with, but add on to that some additional benefit. So, you know, um, if you really like using Dataverse, but it can't do some things you want, allowing you to easily connect that up with other things. So rather than having to overhaul your entire workflow, which is going to be harder for people to do and implement, allowing them to make small changes but connect all of those things up together so that everything is still together and you can make it open. So I want to follow up on Mark's question. And actually, one of my favorite quotes from Mark in the talk, in talk he's given is, uh, if you build it, researchers will do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> so on that theme, um, can you talk about how you reach out to your audience, the audience you've built your products for? And sort of as a follow-on to that, what happens when people that you were not advertising to start using your product, using your services for things you didn't anticipate? And do you pivot? Do you focus on your core? Speak a little bit about reaching out to your audience. How do, how do they discover you? And then what happens when people start using your product in um, unexpected ways? OK, so um, I guess with, with Overleaf, or as it was known, Right LaTeX, I mean, that was a very clear community of people that used LaTeX. And so we built up connections in the, into that community so you could open LaTeX templates and things in Write LaTeX really easily. Um, we also did a lot of work on social media um, and the other sort of fairly cheap ways of reaching people. So I guess pretty much right at the start, people started using Write LaTeX for things that I didn't think they were going to. Like one of the first documents on Write LaTeX was actually a wedding invitation. <laughs> um, so as far as I know, it's the only one, but um, you know, people use it for everything, right? So I think definitely we've seen a lot of growth um, in the sort of interdisciplinary sciences. So if you have computational biologists working with mathematicians or, or physicists and, bi and biologists, you know, there's, there's sort of an impedance mismatch between the tools that each, pe each of these people use and trying to provide a platform that kind of does the, enough for both of them that they can both come together and use it is, I think, a very um, powerful idea and one that I'm... I'm quite excited about seeing that with Overleaf now. Um, so with Publicize, this was actually, it's an interesting question. This is was my biggest concern with starting Publicize. I didn't want anyone just going writing any article in there. It's actually not published research. So with Publicize, there is um, essentially to even be a scientist uh, user, you have to get approved that you have been an author on a published scientific paper. So that kind of eliminates that problem a little bit. Um, but I think that what that actually has done is kind of created a little bit more closed of an environment. And I think that it probably would be more beneficial to allow a little bit more freedom, not just published research to be publicized, essentially. Um, but yeah, that is, that's definitely uh, kind of a concern because this is, you know, I'm trying to build this brand that this is reputable information. So it is extremely important to make sure that the information that's posted is legitimate. And how do you reach out to your audience? 
So yeah, sorry, I didn't address that question. <laughs> um, so what I, the, the best way is actually listservs in academia. Those are really powerful. Um, so listservs are really great. Uh, I got an article in Inside Higher Ed that was extremely helpful with the universities. Um, and um, I've been active on social media, although I'm not very good at it. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, that's been, I've been trying to be as lean as possible. Um, we act, uh, so we are designing our product to be extensible. We want people to use it in unexpected ways. Um, so it's not at all a problem uh, to help with that. The core architecture is built to be kind of a visual programming language, and the uh, it will be we'll have APIs um, export import as many possible ways to end up using it in unexpected ways. Um, and for reaching people, part of reaching people is to create a tool that is so extensible that people just have fun with it and share it with each other. Um, but shareability in the core architecture is critical. So. Uh, the design files are essentially documents that can be collaborative, like Google Docs, or shared as a flat file export, um, which um, everybody wants viral marketing. That's not so easy to achieve. So we hope to achieve some level of that, but um, we don't expect it to sell itself. So there will be marketing components as well. Um, so I can't really speak for how GitHub began. That was sort of 2007. I know we did a lot of work to get core communities on the platform. Um, so you know, we you know, getting high-profile open-source projects onto GitHub was very, very significant in its early days. I think that's um, a transferable thing, bringing a community along. I think so. Thinking about um, kind of people who are um, significant, uh, kind of. In a, in a particular network of academia and getting them onto your platform using your tools um, would be a good strategy. So, um, But to speak to sort of how people are using GitHub, I've seen the weirdest stuff in the last year. Um, there's libraries who have uploaded 100,000 books to GitHub, um, who, unless they're all open source, don't pay a single dollar. Um, um, Jeff was saying something about having your revenue model aligned with your um, your mission, maybe I'm paraphrasing slightly. Like, you know, our mission, uh, we, you know, we people pay for privacy on GitHub. People, lots of people don't realize how we make money. We make money for uh, on those repositories that people choose to not make open source. So if you come along and upload 200,000 repositories tomorrow in an open source fashion, we won't charge you a single cent. And so I've seen uh, libraries upload huge amounts of data. That's actually tested infrastructure at times. I've seen. Uh, academics shard genome sequences and put them in repositories again like things that usually usually um, expect the unexpected I think that happens a lot and so that hasn't necessarily affected how uh, we present the product but it does affect uh, sometimes it affects technology decisions about the way that you go forward like academics have been amongst the most sort of uh, abusive of our platform in the nicest possible way so. <laughs> Uh, so I would actually say, in terms of outreach, uh, we're not actually very good at it, uh, at Zenodo, um, and as an international organization as well. Uh, it's definitely something we hope to ramp up. What we do is that we, we do try to spread the word to a lot of people that can then multiply it. We do engage. When people then come to, um, come to us, we do engage heavily in them and make sure that they are happy with, what the, with the features uh, so that they can spread the word. Um, and in terms of unexpected uses, I think um, a lot of the use we have uh, are, are completely in line with what Sonoda does. I think the most unusual ones are the people who say, hey, can I say install a copy of uh, Sonoda at my local institution? Um, and in those respects, I think it goes a little bit against this infrastructure principle that uh, Jeffrey was, was talking about as well. But we're happy to help them actually uh, fork off Sonoda which uh, fork off the underlying software in Vineo and actually help them build up their own, uh, own data repository in that way. Yeah, um, and at the OSF, you know, we purposely built it to be very flexible. You can upload whatever you want to it. I haven't seen anything too bizarre yet. I'm sure at some point somebody will start uploading cat pictures because it's the internet and cats are everywhere. Um, but, you know, that's, it's really fine with us. We built it for scientists, so those are our audience, and we do try and you know, always check in with them and say, hey, how is this working for you? What can we do better? Um, but it is open and free to everybody. So if you want to upload pictures of cats, you're welcome to do that. Um, and in terms of reaching our audience, um, we've started doing a lot of outreach. So going around to universities, um, interacting with grad students, postdocs, researchers, um, 
doing training events about you know, open and reproducible practices, some of which are just about general workflow, some of it's about you know, how to integrate the OSF practically into what they do. Um, and we also, in terms of outreach, are always looking around to see, hey, are there people out there who are kind of doing similar things to what we're doing or thinking on starting similar things and maybe they don't have a home for it yet, can we find a way to collaborate with them on their project to help um, grow both projects? Oh, sorry. Give me much more questions. Okay. Oh, um, um, I was just wondering. So we heard a little bit about some of uh, some of sort of the relationship uh, that some of these, uh, some of the panels, some of their products have with with libraries. Uh, so it seems like you know there's a lot of uh, its product to, to end user, end user being the researcher. But where do you see libraries fitting in here? Uh, if at all, and, and I'm just wondering about sort of any relationships that you might have with libraries. Do you mean physical libraries or <laughs> software libraries? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the context of marketing. Yeah. 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 Physical uh, libraries. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so for us, we work with the uh, text digital library, and we work with um, uh, a lot of. <clears throat> I suppose non, non-traditional libraries. So you know, we, we see a lot of people that, that come to us and say, "Hey, I have, you know, I, I have you know five or six petabytes of, of data that I need to, to offload. Their, their reference connection, their reference collections, their um, their archived manuscripts, their every book that's been you know written, electronic thesis dissertations, all that stuff, right? So um, we kind of need to. We've been working with them trying to to figure out as part of a larger data initiative of of how we can keep that stuff available for, for long periods of time in, in dark storage, how we can keep it available in, in terms of the metadata and discovery and what search means and in context like that. Uh, so I've been involved with the National Digital Stewardship Alliance for a while um, in my previous role and still sometimes um, this now. Um, I guess my main relationship or GitHub's main relationship is probably through personal connections with people like Chris Urban here in Harvard and uh, uh, and Lars Zenodo. I mean, I worry about the fact that uh, you can go to GitHub and delete all your stuff. This does happen by accident. Usually when people are trying to turn off email notifications and somebody made them an admin by mistake and they just delete their whole company's profile. And luckily we can get that back for you really easily if you do that. But it's a real problem, especially for um, archiving of, of um, I think, software. Especially there's a longevity thing that actually um, isn't kind of built into what we do. So. Um, more formal than that, not really, but but conversations happening for sure. Uh, so I would actually say that libraries are one of our end users. Um, we've been working heavily with uh, with uh, Chris Atman at Harvard CFA, for instance. We also have a lot of smaller libraries um, that are interested in using Zenodo as a platform. Um, and I see that it's actually the the bigger libraries that are not really interested in uh, using external platforms, where all the smaller ones see the benefit of not having to run their own infrastructure anymore and rely on, on, uh, on a common place. Um, for us, we're not really uh, targeting libraries, um, but we are trying to integrate with publishers and uh, uh, some of the new generation of publishers, Big Share or, um, or uh, Factory 1000 that are publishing um, figures, methods, uh, research objects. and so our uh, protocols and processes would be able to get a digital object identifier and then one click, uh, click publishing of a complete experimental record, including what you did and all the data associated with it in a, in a mineable way. So that ultimately will make it to a library, but not directly. Sure, I guess at Overleaf we kind of work with libraries in two ways. Um, First, I, I know some libraries have taken a sort of leading role in procuring software for researchers to use and sort of a research information perspective. So we sometimes deal with them um, to sell bulk licenses of Overleaf or to, to look at sort of trials and things like that. Um, and then second, I know we're working with some universities to handle thesis submissions that go through the library. So um, on Overleaf, it, it's quite easy to make sort of templated documents. So if you have a standard thesis template, and you get all your students writing their thesis on Overleaf, then everything comes in in the right format. And that's been of interest uh, to a number of libraries. 
Um, for Publicize, I haven't um, really made any strong effort to work with libraries, but I would like to. Uh, I think libraries are a really good resource, especially to connect with the researchers at the uh, universities. Um, I plan to implement the DOI so each one of these lay articles can be actually cited by a DOI. Um, ultimately, my big vision is to have kind of like a mouse over effect or something on a title where you can see the title in its full form but then kind of mouse over and then see the, the lay title. I think that would be the most efficient for anyone. Um, so that's kind of the, the ultimate goal. and. Uh, it's going to be a long road to get there. <laughs> um, and at the Center for Open Science, we kind of work with libraries in two different ways. Um, because libraries at many institutions are the ones who um, do a lot of work and training and outreach on data management and um, data curation for the researchers at that institution, we generally talk to libraries about how we can support them in the training of those practices and you know the new tools that are out there and available to researchers. Um, and we're also working on the share notification system with the ARL, the American Research Librarians. Yeah, I'm terrible with, thank you. I'm terrible with acronyms, it's really bad. Um, so the share notification system, which is a system whereby um, universities and institutions can get notifications and researchers at those universities um, publish articles and code and data sets that are open so the university can better track um, what is being put out there by the researchers who are working with them. Yes. Sorry, it's really on. Um, I was struck by, Mr. Smith, what you said at the end of your presentation about reproducibility being a workflow and not a workflow and cultural and not a technology problem, and that really resonated with me, so I was interested to hear any more discussion or commentary that the panel wants to have on that. I can comment further. I mean, uh, yeah. So um, we touched a bit on it already. I mean, my my um, my uh, I'm I'm always kind of skeptical of reproducibility as a goal in itself. I think it's obviously you can't argue against it, but at the same time, it's um, I think we should be reaching for. Um, there's so, like, let me start again. There are so many people when I go and talk on a campus about GitHub who have no idea what version control is, that we're a very, very long way away, I think, from kind of executable papers and turnkey kind of, kind of research um, packages that can just be shared and forked and whatever. And I think I would love to see us there, but I think we're often, um, I would like to see us focus more on um, some of the kind of earlier steps towards that goal. And I think if you use tools like a lot of us develop and work on, then reproducibility is a kind of a byproduct of using better tools. And I don't, um, so yeah, that's my, so I, uh, I'm slightly I, um, nervous and skeptical about lots of resources going into platforms that solve this wonderful problem that we all understand, because I think it misses, I think we end up focusing on uh, reproducibility goals over kind of product goals, which can be making great tools that people enjoy using. And so if you can do them both, then great. But most of these project projects are run on relatively small budgets. And I think the amount of money that you would need to do it well is uh, enormous. So anyway, I told you I was going to shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> well, I, I, I fundamentally agree, right? So uh, reproducibility is a, is a byproduct of good research, right? So <clears throat> we, we build it into Agave platform because we got really tired of watching tens, honestly, hundreds of millions of dollars go into reinventing the wheel um, in academic software over and over and over. And people not fundamentally understanding the difference that research software is different than commercial software. And the effort it takes to go from one to the other is more than the effort it take, took to come up with the research software. Um, so we bake it in, right? Um, I think it's sometimes confusing when we, we ta start talking in this context that um, we, we forget that there are a lot of different kinds of users, right? So the, the target audience for, for our platform are developers, people that are actually building tools, right? You don't see um, very often a, uh, an end scientist come in and say, oh, you know, I, I love what Agave did for me. I love, you know, I did this and that. I really like the API. Ooh, hypermedia, yay. They just, they don't value those kind of things. What they value is, hey, 
I, I was using this app the other day and I was able to, to share this, you know, three petabyte data set, right, with a single click. I can get a URL for anything and I don't have to authenticate again, right? I can share anything from anywhere, right? Um, I could publish my paper. I have a DOI for this whole experiment. When people went to review my work, <clears throat> they could rerun the entire, the entire thing end to end and validate the output that I got. That's what they get excited about, right? But those are different end users and you kind of got to keep those in mind. And I, I don't, I think that there is value in building these platforms and I am, in my humble but accurate opinion, there's, there's value in building these platforms because they're really stinking hard to do. And people aren't going to pull them off and as our, our keynote pointed out, we've tried it over and over and over and over again and when you, when you try to get an infrastructure as a byproduct of research, you're, you're, you're <laughs> You're, you're aiming at nothing and hitting it every time, right? Because what you need is infrastructure, you don't need research. So I, I think that you need to buy into that and you need to invest in the infrastructure so that, that reproducibility is just taken for granted, right? That it just be, it's just something that's there. Just like um, when I log, I'm gonna hand off the mic, but when, when I opened my laptop in here, I started getting flooded with notifications because I've been in four time zones in two days, right? So. Microsoft Online thinks that my account got hacked because I'm, you know, I, I'm logging in from all these different places in a short period of time. Security is a byproduct of using that platform, right? I think reproducibility should be as well. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting anecdote, actually. Um, I, I was also going to do an anecdote, so I, I don't disagree with with any of this, but um, I think it's maybe a little bit, a little bit negative. Like I think we've got such a long way to go between from where we are now to like perfect reproducibility. Um, that there's a lot of progress that we could make. So like, for example, when I was an undergraduate, I was assigned a task to implement a, an algorithm for variational motion segmentation or something. And this, this was um, described over the course of like three or four papers in hard to find journals. And the key bit of it was actually in like an unpublished technical report in Japanese that I had to go and like dig up from library interloan services. So. Like that's that's kind of where we are now with reproducible research. I think that using tools like GitHub or, or any of the tools we've talked about today would already be such a huge improvement on that that I think there's a long way to go, and we shouldn't be shouldn't be too negative about um, things that we can do to to improve reducibility. I agree completely with the statement about research uh, reproducibility. Um, essentially, it's a problem of the workflow, um, but. Um, but I guess from the publicized perspective, I look at reproducibility uh, from a different perspective in that I think a lot of research is being reproduced unnecessarily. <laughs> and uh, because there's a lack of communication between fields. So from my perspective, actually, I want to reduce the reproducibility of research <laughs> and... Um, replication. Replication, yeah, <laughs> or, or reproducing. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so essentially, um, I think that it would be very useful if we can get all of these research projects in terms that other people can understand so that we can see what has actually happened in different, in different fields because there's a lot of overlap, especially with methods and algorithms between all of these fields, as, especially as we keep advancing in computers. So I think that, um, yeah, I come at it from a very different perspective. So there were... There's really two questions that were being answered. The question of workflow, I so wholeheartedly believe and agree with that, that started a company, Riffin, to uh, make workflow uh, a part of the process, an explicit part of the process, not an afterthought or, oh, I'm going to document it as metadata or some sort of side project. So um, I think workflow is critical, and I think it's critical to start that at the very beginning, as upstream as you can go in the research uh, undertaking, um, and that's what we're trying to do. The second question was about reproducibility, and I have to say um, I totally disagree with the idea that reproducibility is a byproduct. That's like saying that uh, airline safety is a byproduct of running airlines. If you don't focus on safety with 100% of your effort, it will not be safe. We get to experience it as a byproduct because as users, that's not our, our um, my, uh, primary objective. But the people who are at that airplane, at those airlines, take safety with absolute seriousness. And manufacturers take quality with absolute focus. And until the R&D industry takes quality with absolute seriousness, it will not be quality. And so 
what we're trying to do is make it easy at Riffin to take quality seriously, not make it a huge drain on your resources. Does somebody have a mic for Sam Alex? Okay, it's on. So I think um, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said here. It's definitely that you have to get the, the reproducibility, reducibility worked into the tools so that it's really a no-brainer for a researcher to do the right thing. I think it's about the, the usability of, these, of, of doing it the right thing that's important. And I think that uh, research could actually learn quite a lot from software development. I, when you look at, the, at a lot of the packages on, on GitHub, they can actually be uh, downloaded, installed, and tested in a fully automated way. Uh, most uh, software developers don't have to think too much. They just have to follow the short guide that is actually on the front page, which is like three lines of, of uh, codes they have to do. And if more research tools were like this, then I think uh, you wouldn't have to think so much about the reproducibility. Yeah, and I mean, I agree with a lot of what's been said, um, but there are different types of reproducibility, right? Depending on what field you're in, that word can be used very differently. There's reproducibility in the sense that if you take somebody's data and the code and you rerun it, you should reproduce the same numbers. But there's also the question of, you know, if I take the methods and the materials you used and I go and do your experiment again, will I actually get the same results? And I think workflow can help with both of those, right, if I have really well documented um, data and code, then it's, and I've made that open source, it's more likely that somebody can download that and rerun it and get the right numbers. And if I, you know, provide all my materials online, it's probably more likely that somebody can at least try to replicate my experiment because they at least know what I've done. But in terms of, you know, replicating the statistical findings, if you redo the whole paper, there is a large component of that that comes down to really you know, having a good statistical workflow. That's something we didn't talk about a lot. Um, but I think that is something that can be done in an open source way, but it's something that really has to start even before a project has been done. And so I think it, it, having the goal of reproducibility is important. It does often come out of having goals of openness and transparency in a well-documented workflow, but I think it's important to keep both in mind. Okay. so. Um... I'm William Gunn, I'm with uh, Mendeley, and this has been really interesting, uh, but I know we're coming up to the, to the end, so I'll try to be really um, uh, precise. Uh, it seems to me a lot of what you guys are talking about is, are things that are on the top of that sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, reproducibility as this ultimate end goal, you know, pie in the sky sort of thing, but there's a lot of basic stuff, you know, infrastructure is kind of stuff that needs to be there um, in order to get to there. So. Um, I was kind of inspired by some of the stuff Riffin was saying about instrumenting the actual lab equipment, you know, and getting that stuff in there um, so that you don't have variability from how people record stuff. That seems to be kind of one of those lower down on the on the pyramid. What are some other things that you know that you guys, w with your platforms, could do to make the metadata attached to data sets better, so that, for example, data search works better or uh, discovery or something works better? Um, so we're pretty late in the um, in the research data life cycle. Like you look at it, we're right down at the publishing process. And actually, the best place to start collecting uh, all your metadata is by using tools that does it for you. So it's already when you start planning your um, your your data collection that you should be grabbing this data out. You should be uh, using tools like, for instance, the the lab notebooks. Is a good example where you can then go with a barcode scanner, scan and say, hey, I use this slice of the mouse brain, I use this plasmid, I use this from this uh, drawer. Um, I think we need to develop the tools that really support you in, in doing the things in the right way, and then all the later stages can actually uh, depend on, on all, the, all this metadata that be, can be ingested into the files. So I would love to see people versioning their desktop or whatever whatever they're working with, whatever file formats they're working with at any point in time. Um, one of the, I'm not sure this quite answers your question, but one of the differences I see between software development and um, academic collaboration, sometimes around software too, is uh, a large uh, astronomy project is 
currently looking at moving lots of their software to GitHub, and they have a fundamental difference in the way that they use, for example, a part of the product, like comments on a line, like re review comments. Uh, a, a typical uh, comment from a colleague from um, uh, on my code at GitHub will be, hey, white space fix, you know, two spaces here, please, whatever. It's like code formatting uh, sort of problems. Or sometimes, hey, actually, that isn't the syntactic style we like here. Um, in this other project, there'll be, actually, I don't agree with your version of gravity here. And then they'll have this huge discussion that actually is crucial in terms of like the decisions that were made around how the software was put together, or even maybe how the paper was put together. But it's a fundamentally different type of discussion that's happening. And so um, th th we don't capture that very well, uh, or it isn't kind of front and center when you go and check in on the work again in a few years' time. So I think, I don't know, um, yeah, so I mean, I think versioning is just kind of sensible. Um, I, lots of people aren't doing it. Um, I would love to, you know, so I, I consider it a pretty low-level activity, but then exposing the decisions that were made to make a change at, is, a, I think, a harder problem, because uh, often that's kind of hidden away and buried in weird places. So my wife and I hate making our bed, right? We have like a bunch of sheets and comforters and pillows and stuff, you can imagine. We hate making our bed, and we were we were traveling back, and we were looking at one of the, the SkyMall catalogs, and in there, there was this, there was this um, product, and it was it was this set of sheets, right? That um, they they had a lot of flack. The top sheet was like really really huge, but it it um, it buttoned on to the the corners of the bed, right? So you could get in, you could get out, you could move it, but your bed never got messy. And we sat there and we looked like we just found fire. <laughs> we, we were like Prometheus, hello, this is awesome. Right, it was a game changer for us, and I, I, I think that when you, when you know, we as tool builders sometimes engage new audiences that they look at these tools a lot in the same way. Right, they're like, "Wow, I didn't even know that was possible. Wow, I can, I can link stuff, and and I, I like what you're doing because you, you know, you, it's, it's, it's another step in the process of, of automating the delivery of software to, to an end user, right? And um, it just, it takes the people out of the middle. And I, I think that that's where it really needs to start is, um, you know, you want to re eliminate reproducibility. Well, you have to communicate what's been done first and let people know it's available. So um, I, it, it's a hard problem, but I think we kind of need to start there, just engaging more and more people. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I'd say, again, Overleaf is kind of a bit later in the research life cycle, but um, a lot of people do use it just as a sort of electronic lab notebook, as a way of just capturing stuff as you're going forward. So it's it's not automatic, but it is very flexible. So I think anything that just helps you capture things and version them is a very good step. Um, I kind of, I guess, want to repeat the, uh, what Arpin said about uh, commenting. I think that that was kind of his main point in that I think comments are actually probably in code or um, basically the details associated with the decision-making process of your research. That's actually what's most crucial. And, and the vast majority of researchers don't put those details in the paper because, that, I mean, that would be a horrible paper to read. So one of the big challenges of reproducibility is actually communicating every single decision and every single, basically, line of code that where you made some kind of decision. Um, th especially when researchers use different languages, they use different tools, that's a, a fundamentally difficult, uh, that's a very difficult problem. And um, I think that better communication is the key. Riffin, our ultimate vision and mission is to get to the point where quality, um, uh, provenance, um, uh, shareability of research isn't an, oh yeah, let's do that after I'm done with my research. It actually is the research. It is the way you do research. Just the same way that you would start a mechanical design process with com a computer-aided design file or an architectural project with a blueprint. You would never do that after the fact. You do that as part of the process, and that's what we're trying to do. Go upstream so it's not a separate thing. It is the process. Um, 
and, and that I hope will address. At the OSF, you know, part of what we do is we try and get journals to adopt better open and reproducible practices because a lot of times researchers will say, you know, okay, I see the point, but that's one more thing I have to do. But if it's something where, um, you know, the journal says, hey, we suggest this or we require this, um, you can get a lot more movement from people. So one of the things that um, we suggest and that some journals are starting to implement are pre-registrations. Um, so, you know, before you run an experiment saying what you're going to do, what hypothesis is, the statistical analyses you're going to do. And so that thinking about the workflow and the versioning really does have to start happening way before, like, anything has ever been run. But part of that is just because the community came together and said, we now care about this. Um, so, like, in cognitive psychology, you see a lot more detail about the computer systems that are used recorded because people kind of came together and said, wait, this really does matter for our research. We figured out that, you know, the refresh rate of the computer is actually something that is very important for our research. In social psychology, you don't see that detail recorded as, as often. I think it's detail that is really important, but I think it's something that the community will have to at some point come to a realization about, hey, these are important details for us. Maybe we don't include them in a paper, but they are, you know, logged in version somewhere. files, they were uploaded or Excel files, mm -hmm. but no one but the person who originally did the experiment can make head or tails of it when it comes up and someone finds it later. Yeah, yeah. and so part of the training we do is to teach people about, you know, what a code book is and what a well curated um, Excel file is so that, you know, the, the OSF is never going to be one of those really well curated um, and it's never trying to be data repositories like ICPSR, um, where you know when your data set comes in, one guy is literally assigned to go through your data set and make it available. We kind of see ourselves as the middle ground, where you know that data is going to have to live somewhere before it maybe eventually moves on to a repository, if it does ever move on to a repository. So um, you know we would love for it to be hosted somewhere where it is logged and versioned and open. Hopefully, you upload it in a way that other people can understand it, and we will help that through training. Um, but it's not a requirement like it is in one of those really, really well curated repositories. Right, so we're a little bit over time. Oh. Really quick, quick question. Come on. And we'll break for coffee. So she's holding you up here. Comment. Which is just that this discussion reminds me a little bit of my research group meeting last week. And so if those of you who don't know me, I'm an astronomer, and I do have an astronomy research group. It's my hobby. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, some students and postdocs were having this bizarre conversation where they were fighting about whether there really is a workflow and whether you can get a paper done by having a plan in advance, taking some data, doing what you're supposed to do, publish the paper, go on to the next one, or whether screwing around was more productive. And I always think screwing around is much more productive. And so when you said a minute ago, there's no, you know, you would never do blah, blah, blah without a blueprint, yes, you would, okay? And so I think there's a lot of science that gets done where people take some data for one reason and then they just like mess around with it and then they mess around some more and they don't really know in advance, you know, what their process is. And so it's really hard in some fields to sort of back that out. And I think that the reason that these workflow systems get used more in genomics and fields like that is because there is more of a process. And in labs, there is more of a process. It's more important to have a process. But in fields like astronomy, where nobody's life depends on this, there's a lot of messing around. And the most creative results come from that. So I'm not saying that we should give up. But I agree with Arfan that, that, that actual reproducibility is usually not our goal. It's sort of reusability of what somebody did. And so we have a very different set of, of standards and goals. And so I'm just going to say that I know that Jeff told us that you shouldn't think about discipline-specific things. But I do think that in disciplines where you know, people's lives depend on it, there's a whole different story uh, around reproducibility than in fields where they don't. Well, many thanks to the panel. And, and Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.